gospel for this Sunday is found in the book of Mark, the sixth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. So the people saw them going, the disciples and Jesus, and many recognized them and ran together on foot from all the cities and got there ahead of them. When Jesus went ashore, he saw a large crowd and felt compassion for them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And so he began to teach them many things. And when it was already late, the disciples came up to Jesus and said, This place is secluded and it is already late. Send them away <clears throat> so that they may go into the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. But Jesus answered them, You give them something to eat. <laughs> and then they said to him, But... Shall we go and spend 200 denarii on bread and give it to them? Jesus said to them, How many loaves do you have? Go and look. So when they found out, they said, We have five and two fish. And so he ordered them all to be reclined in groups on the green grass. They were reclined in groups of hundreds and fifties. And he took the five loaves and two fish, looking up to heaven. He blessed the food, broke the loaves, gave them to the disciples again and again, set them before them. And he divided the two fish amongst them all. And they all ate and were satisfied. They picked up twelve baskets of broken pieces of bread and the fish. They were five thousand people, men who had e eaten of the loaves. The gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Bless this word today and fill us with your presence. Again and again we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Oh, we're so grateful again for this opportunity this day to be with you and open up the Holy Scripture. I'm going to do something very different because the word that I just read for today, it just is not even in the lectionary. Can you believe the feeding of the 5,000 is not in the lectionary this year at this point, even though it follows the lessons that we've read these last couple of weeks. And in fact, so I'm going to piece this back together for you a little bit because the vignettes in chapter 6, this particular one has been removed from its context. All of them have been. And so today's lectionary would have us read from the Gospel of John. And this story, however, takes before, before half of last week's lesson. If you were with me last week's lesson, you understand that last week's lesson was split into two. It takes one part, it's like a bookend, to the feeding of the 5,000, and it gets rid of the feeding of the 5,000 puts it together, and then puts the feeding of the 5,000 together today, in today's lesson from the Gospel of John, which is absolutely baffling. I don't get it. Mark has a purpose. Mark has a theme for developing these stories in the order in which they're developed in a way that is disrupted by the reading of the lectionary. So I am going to go through the lectionary of Gospel of Mark 6 and the way that Mark intends us to see it and hear it so that we can come to some understanding of what Mark is trying to do today. <clears throat> First of all, chapters 3 to 5, Jesus and his disciples spent many time traveling together throughout uh, uh, the countryside, and they were hearing the parables of Jesus. So the story is the hearing of the parables. So we hear the parables, and then Jesus comes to his hometown, chapter 6, verses 1 to 6, and he receives a really bad homecoming there in Nazareth. The people of his community, the people who knew him, the people who changed his diapers, ridiculed him and reject him. And therefore, Jesus says he finds more receptance, acceptance in the surrounding villages. He leaves his hometown and goes there. And then we're told that Jesus commissions the 12 for a mission trip, chapter 6, verse 7 to 13. And that's what we read in a couple of weeks ago, the disciples were sent to preach and heal in the name of Jesus, and many people responded to the name of Jesus. Then we are told that John the Baptist is executed. That was a couple of weeks ago again. Herod heard the report of it, and what people, what their disciples were doing in the name of Jesus, and you think that John the Baptist came back to haunt him. Because Herod, during his time of stupidity, remember what he did? Drunken stupidity, he executed John at the request of Herodias, Herodotus' daughter, uh, daughter. And we never hear from Herod again in the Gospel of Mark. Mark just absolutely dismisses Herod as a buffoon at this point. He's gone. Now I know if you're thinking, wait a minute, he appears before 
Herod in, in the last days, so, you know, right before his death, that's other gospel accounts. I'm talking about the Gospel of Mark, okay? Now, uh, five, disciples returned from their mission trip, and it went swimmingly well. They're excited about their success, but they're worn out from their efforts, and they're tired, and they needed a break. But then Jesus is inundated by all these people, today's lesson, who come again for the blessing of Jesus. And Jesus uh, spends all day preaching to them and giving of his healing, not his curing. Certainly maybe he cured some people physically, but he was healing them or beginning the process of salvation in their lives. Whoo, he's spreading the good news. Then at the end of the night, Jesus' disciples say, Jesus, can you just send these people away? It's time, it, we're hungry, we'd like to eat. They're all hungry, they need to go home. Jesus, why don't you feed them? And they're like, are you kidding me, Jesus? We don't have enough resources to feed ourselves, let alone all these people. We don't have, you know, a handful of fish and loaves, and that's about all we got. Five loaves of bread, two fish, 100 denarii maybe at most, which isn't going to go very far. So it is at this point that Jesus uses a very common formula for Holy Communion. He says, go and distribute it. And he takes bread, he lifts it up. It's an acknowledgement of gratitude for the source who gave us the bread. That's why we pray before a meal, right? We are grateful for God giving. We're not, we're not, we're not you know, asking for a blessing on it. We are, again giving thanks to God for what he's given us. That is where we get the Greek name for Holy Communion, Eucharisto, which means Thanksgiving or Eucharist. So Jesus lifts the bread. He then blesses it. He, in other words, dedicates it for its intended purpose. Then he breaks it. Again, reminding of how Jesus would break himself as an offering for the world. And then he distributed the meal to those, everyone who had gathered there. 5,000 men, we are told. So it might have been, who knows how many? 15,000 people or so. Now here's the amazing thing. Notice something very important. Notice that Jesus doesn't evaluate the worthiness of the people who are going to receive this meal. He just gives it to them and blesses them. See, I say that because oftentimes in our churches, we make a distinction and say, well, who's worthy of partaking of this meal? Nobody's worthy of partaking of the Holy Communion meal. Nobody, not one. So we should never ask whether or not a person, person is worthy to partake of Holy Communion. I am telling you, if they have their hand out, I am giving them communion. Doesn't matter what you think of them or whether you think it's right. If it's good enough for Jesus, it's good enough for Pastor Dave. If Jesus would have fed them, I will feed them too. Then we're told that the leftovers are taken up. There are 12 baskets full total, which represents the numbers. I, who knows? There could have been 15, 20. Who, who knows? Could have been 10. But I think the point that the gospel writer of Mark is trying to make is that this number 12 is symbolic of the nation or the the. Uh, the, uh, the, the number of disciples in the tribes of Israel, and it's an indication that God intends to bless the world, every corner of the world, with his love. Immediately after this lesson, Jesus' disciples are sent away, while Jesus is cleaning up the mess and, uh, and finishing his ministry with these people, and then we have the story of a walking of water. Also a lesson that is not in the lectionary. Are you kidding me? Stiples are still tired and cranky, and Jesus sends them on a boat to the other side, and there they go to pray. And the trip of the disciples is quite eventful, quite frankly, because the wind is against them, and Jesus walks right up to the boat and gives uh, peace to them. We read that lesson a couple of weeks ago. And then finally, it ends with this story of healing. This makes no sense if you don't read this as a unit. Those who touch the hem of Jesus' robe get more than they are bargained for. They don't just get cured of their physical ailments. They may be physically cured, but what they do 
And what Jesus truly gives them is he starts them in a journey of healing. That's what we looked at last week. So that is the overarching lesson that we learn from the Gospel of Mark and the direction that he's shoving us in. But what Mark is trying to do is convince us that when we see Jesus, God is in our midst. Remember how I told you several weeks ago that Mark never tells us who Jesus truly is. Mark shows us who Jesus is by his actions. And you need to see Mark 6 as a unit in order to understand what Mark is trying to tell us about who this Jesus is. God is on a mission to bring healing to this world, and to this broken world, and God has called us, you and me, to be participants in this healing. So we need to stop making the Gospels about human personalities, about the congregations in which we are in. The focus is always upon Jesus because Jesus is that healing in the beginning of the healing process for this world. And so whether the gift of Jesus is offered to the world in a paper cup and a plated chalice, a gold-plated chalice, or in a uh, dirty clasped hands, Jesus is a blessing to all who receive him. Now, here's the thing that we learn, I think, from the lesson today. We're like the disciples. We don't have the resources to bless the world. We don't. And that's okay. We don't have the money. We are oftentimes empty of the caring and compassion for many people of the world. We're tired and cranky and need a vacation. But God's healing crashes in the world despite us, regardless of us, or regardless of our lack, and oftentimes because of our lack, to demonstrate that it is God who is doing the blessing of the world. Once again, it's not about you and me. It's about Jesus. That's what the arch of this story is supposed to convince us of. God has begun his work of healing on this world that continues to this very day. And it will end when the world comes to its conclusion and all of us are resurrected and reunited with Jesus Christ in the kingdom to come. He blesses us. This is an important part of this verse, verse 40. So when Jesus was distributing of this meal, the people reclined in groups of hundreds and fifties, and guess what he did? And he took five loaves and fish, and after he looked up, he blessed the food and broke the loaves, gave them to the disciples again and again to set before them. We kept it. We are fed day after day after day after day after day. Salvation is a daily process of being renewed in a relationship with God. So you may be overwhelmed. You may at times feel empty. But the person who can fill your cup day after day after day is sitting right in front of you and in your midst, Jesus Christ. He blesses us until we are sufficiently filled. <laughs> Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks again for this word of the day, the sufficient filling of Jesus Christ that gives, that he gives us of himself day after day after day and again and again. It doesn't matter whether we're worthy, whether we come to God with dirty hands, no matter our attitudes in which we come to him, he just feeds us. And so God, let us have that same kindness for those around us that we too may feed those of this world. Whether they seem worthy to us or not, it's not important. We give you away as you gave yourself away freely. That process of salvation, that process of blessing day by day. We give thanks for this in Jesus' name. Amen.